Hello, and welcome to Association Transformation, the not-so-new international conversation advancing the impact and evolution of nonprofit organizations. Brought to you in partnership with the Institute of Association Leadership, we are always seeking a diversity of thought and new examples of innovation in action. That and a commitment to mission-driven organizations has spurred this collaboration between the teams of Brewer Pratt Solutions and Consort Strategy. I'm your co-host, Elisa Pratt, and I'm excited to welcome back my co-host partner in crime, Andrew Chamberlain. Good morning, Andrew. Hi, Elise. How are you doing? <laughs> well, I'm so glad you came with energy today. Thank you. For <laughs> sorry, Elise. I'm still, Thank you for joining me. I'm still me suffering. I'm sorry. I'm still suffering. Uh, like, hold I'm on. going for the sympathy I, my, board here. Going for the hold on. Let me board. dust off my violin. Dust off the I've, violin for you. Well, it, missed, just fake it, okay? Because we have a great three, panel. You missed a lot. I'll send, you, I'll send Hi, you a bill. I'll send hey, Lise. All right, send me the bill. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, just fake it Fake it a little better today because we have a great panel. I'm excited about the topic. It's my whole career. That's my whole career you're talking about. <laughs> Fake it till you make it, right? Come on, just get on with it. All right, come on, chop, chop, get, get it together, get it together. We, yeah. um, we actually do have a really amazing panel today. As you recall, several months back, we brought together new CEOs, first-time CEOs who were dealing with the transition and the new role during all the disruption of a global pandemic. Today, we have something a little different, some, some veterans, if you will, some weathered and long-tenured executives who have not just been CEOs before, but have recently transitioned into new CEO roles either just before or during during this uh, this last 14 months of, of craziness. And we brought them together. We thought it'd be great to to hear what their perspective has been, what challenges they've been been dealing with, and, and with that experience under their belt, how how all of this may have been different for them. So I'm excited. I'm excited to welcome today um, a few a few guests from the United States. Um, a special uh, a special guest from the UK and uh, and we'll get started ladies first uh, Victoria Elliott the new CEO for the Pennsylvania Pharmacists Association hello Victoria thanks for being with us hi Elisa thanks so much for having me really appreciate it absolutely absolutely and not surprisingly another uh, longtime friend of, uh, of Brewer Pratt Solutions and also down I think just down the street from you um, we have Dave DeCluente, the Executive Director at the Master Builders Association of Western Pennsylvania. Dave, thanks for being with us. Hello, Lisa. Thanks for having me. I, uh, yes, and globally speaking, I am right down the street from, uh, from the Pennsylvania Pharmacists <laughs> Association. <Right. laughs> exactly. And last but certainly not least, um, IAL board member and, uh, and new executive officer at the Guild of Architectural Ironmongers, we have Simon Forrester with us this morning. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Andrew. Hello, Simon. Long friend of the show. Friend of the show is how I wanted to introduce him, Lisa. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, Long I'll time listener, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Long time sufferer. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, thanks again for being with us, everyone. I know now in these new roles, you are uh, you're bu as busy as ever, I'm sure, with everything going on, and uh, we appreciate your time. Compared to the last time you took a CEO role, and maybe you can share with us, you know, how many how many times you've been a CEO and for whom. But in this last transition, this cannot have been like anything you've ever been through before. Um, and uh, maybe I'll start with Dave because I know he actually had the benefit of of several months prior to the world coming crashing down. Um, Dave, tell us a little bit about your uh, your transition and when things uh, when things changed. What uh, what you what your greatest challenge was in those those early months? Sure. So I, as you had mentioned, had the the privilege of being on board in this role a few months prior to the global pandemic beginning. Uh, I came on in September of 2019, and I had about a two and a half month transition with the outgoing executive who had been in the role and with the organization for nearly 30 years. And so with that comes its own challenges and benefits, right? And <laughs> that's a that's a different podcast. That's a whole different podcast. <laughs> right. So <laughs> so at the uh, at 12:31 20 uh, 2019 uh, was officially the the, the transition date uh, in many respects and I was really uh, jumping in with both feet um, to the, the transition both in 2019 and in 2020 didn't expect the world to change was still developing relationships, working relationships with staff, 
um, getting to uh, familiarize myself with the board of directors and uh, the various roles and responsibilities. And uh, of course, we also were making some, uh, we needed to make some IT improvements, which the install happened on Friday, March 13th. And by governor's orders, we went remote on Monday, March 16th. So there was some fortuitous <laughs> things that I had put into motion beforehand, which really enabled us to to be successful in, in the early days. But uh, I, <laughs> it was not the way I would have planned my first 12 months. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. So greatest greatest challenge of those first twelve months would be uh, what would you say now in retrospect now that you've survived it? Yes, yes, I would say the greatest challenge was was the the staff uh, the, the transition with staff not having the working uh, relationship there yet fully in place understanding not just how they operate but how I operate um, and that relationship goes both ways. Uh, it, it was definitely the the greatest challenge to try to continue to serve our members and the industry while also moving remote for the first time. And we had some, some internet issues that first week. We actually lost our capacity for email uh, four days into the end of the shutdown and uh, was not the right time to do that. But we all managed and, uh, and continued to advocate and serve our members. Wow. And you're a staff of how many? We are a staff of six, including myself. Okay. All right. Great. Ms. Simon, you, uh, I'm not sure exactly when your transition was considered official, um, but definitely within this, this pandemic window that we've been, uh, been discussing, tell us a little bit about your transition and, and journey into this new role. Okay. Well, I've been in association management. This is, you, you just asked how many roles have you had? I, it's my sixth association role, four of which is CEO. So, uh, you think I'd kind of have it off by Pat by now, but of course the pandemic really threw everyone a, a, a curveball. Um, I came into the role unable to do a transition. My predecessor had left before I started um, and I came in and normally when you come into a, an a association role, you, you sit down with the team, you get to know them, you sit down with your board, you go and visit everybody. I had none of that. The two, the two key things that I would normally do in a, in a role is um, I'd be I'd be a, a cross between a sponge and Prince Charles. And what I mean by that is <laughs> I would I would go around and soak up as much knowledge as I could from the membership. Um, unlike my my colleagues on the podcast tonight today, um, I am not from the architectural ironmongery sector. Well, I think both of you guys were either previous practitioners in your industries. I'm getting nods, that's good. Uh, I've read your biogs right. Um, but for me, this was a new sector. Um, so that was a real challenge. And the other part of it is this kind of the Prince Charles bit where I go around and meet the members and go, and what do you do? And, and talk to them. So I, I really miss out on those things. That's been a real challenge for me. What would our American equivalent of that be? I mean go around and be, I don't, I don't know, be the Bill Clinton? What would, what would we... What you can't draw comparisons. Like, you can't draw comparisons with his royal majesty. Yeah. Is that I'm sacrilege? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm struggling with that one. I don't know. What would, I mean, be the, be the Oprah? Yeah, depending I don't on know. your answer, I think it, depending on your answer, I think it frames your view of Prince Charles. So I'll, I'll stay quiet. <laughs> Oh my goodness! All right, I, I apologize, uh, Simon. What uh, what was your greatest challenge in the? Well, first of all, when when did this transition occur? How many months do you have under your belt with the Iron Monks? So this was this was just the start of December, so relatively oh. new into the role compared to uh, the other guys. So they they should be much further on than I am. But um, I mean, the biggest challenge I think was was just understanding all of the issues that faced not only the association but its but its members. So getting my head around that that with and doing it remotely um, and building trust, uh, trust within the team, but also trust with the members. I, you know, I've been parachuted into this and all they know of me is, is a face on a screen. And that's, I think, something of a challenge that we're still working to overcome. And what, uh, how many staff do you have? Uh, same as Dave, there's six of us. Okay, interesting, interesting. Victoria, hello. Hi. Thanks for your patience <laughs> while we let sure. these uh, these guys tell their stories. Now, to to Simon's point, you do come from from the industry that you you now represent. You had some experience uh, in the past. Tell us a little bit about how you've uh, you've uh, landed with the, the the pharmacist association these days and when that transition occurred. So uh, I landed there 
in a transition role about mid-November with the outgoing CEO who had been there for 18 years. So like Dave, you know, walking into a pretty well-established um, situation uh, where she had accomplished quite a bit for this association after pulling him out of significant debt when she took over um, and then launching quite a number of new programs. Um, but did have, you know, an opportunity there up until the holidays to try and you know, learn as much as I could, uh, but certainly never long enough. Um, I do come from the industry, so I'm a licensed pharmacist in the state of Pennsylvania. Actually managed uh, my first uh, role as a CEO, and I've had, um, this is now my sixth, uh, like Simon. Um, I actually managed a competing organization here in the state, which uh, represented the industry which I was in, which was health system, hospital and health system pharmacy. So kind of an interesting transition to this role. I come in with um, some credibility in that regard. Um, actually, probably one of the top reasons I was selected for the position because of my history, my understanding of the profession, and a lot of the networking I already brought to the role. So I had that leg up coming into it, which I think walking in during the middle of a pandemic was a significant um, advantage. Um, but having started when I did was also just about the time that the state started rolling out uh, their vaccines for COVID-19. And we have quite a few pharmacies engaged in that um, administrative process. Um, so for me, as my president and I like to say, it's all COVID all day. And that yeah. really has only started to slow down in the last couple of weeks. Unfortunately, more because some of our pharmacies um, got turned off, if you will, and are not receiving vaccine by a state order. That's a whole nother discussion. Um, because we certainly aren't near our vaccination rates right now. So really, a lot of my time has been spent advocating on behalf of any you know, willing pharmacy to get vaccine, particularly in our medically underserved areas where we know we don't have a, a provider right now. So that, you know, from a challenge standpoint, has been the challenge. So like Simon, didn't have the chance to do the tour, which I had intended to do, to really uh, get to know our members on the ground in their workplaces, we have seven schools of pharmacy with which we have relationships, which is another challenge for us. So establishing those relationships um, and really, you know, having time to put your arms around all the issues. From a staff perspective, I will say, actually, I think we're pretty fortunate. So like you all, I'm on about five and a half, six FTEs. Um, uh, I established uh, some pretty, you know, straightforward expectations. Um, they are actually having opportunities now that they didn't uh, seem to have before. Um, and I'm engaging them in some decision-making, holding them accountable for some outcomes, which they're taking on um, willingly and uh, enjoying what they're doing. So I was able to kind of hit the ground running with them. We were remote um, three out of the five days a week. We've just moved to three, three days in the office and two remote. But um, I, I'm listening to Dave and his technology challenges. We didn't have those, thank heavens, because um, that would have been a whole nother layer of complexity. So um, shout out to you, Dave, for managing through all that. But yeah, um, it's been a whirlwind and I'm just starting to, you know, find a little bit of breathing room to now focus on some of our programmatic challenges. One of the, I'm interested in, it's inter all three of you have, you know, raised the question about the, the tour or the royal tour in Simon's case, <laughs> uh, the, you know, that, that, that kicks off when you uh, when you when you start in the new role. But I'm curious as to you know Simon in particular. You, you sort of suggested that because we weren't you know you're not able to you know walk the pavements, walk the streets, and and shake hands with people. That somehow that was that was prohibiting your sort of the the establishing your profile and your credibility as a chief executive. Why do you think that is? I mean, surely to goodness tech would make it easier for you to reach out to as more people than than you would normally isn't that wouldn't you say i think there's there's a couple of things there one is the the situation i find myself unlike uh, my fellow speakers i am uh, coming into a role that hasn't had a, a long-term incumbent in fact there have been four ceos in four years right, right. so okay. so um wow, there's nice. a little bit that, that. that's another podcast <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah maybe that's wow. a happy hour podcast yeah catch, catch me on, a, on on that one another time but but that's that's a challenge i mean that kind of like well is this guy going to be around you know what's what's happening uh, you know we keep we keep seeing changing faces do we need to build that relationship up? so that's a that's a challenge. And the other one, I think, is um, that for, uh, uh, well, 
particularly for for people shall we say my age and older they they want that 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 look you in the eyes uh, handshake um i mean just within my my own board at the moment having conversations about uh whether we should be holding meetings virtually or face to face and some people are absolutely uh dead set on they, that meetings must be face to face despite the uh, ongoing restrictions within the UK around covid uh, at, at time of recording um they're still really keen to uh, to meet face to face and i think that's an issue culturally that we we you know, when we come out of the back of this, we, we're going to have a challenge about do we have hybrid meetings, do we have face to face meetings, do we continue to meet via Zoom and Teams? But do we think then, uh, you know, that leads me nicely then onto the issue around the relationship. For me, the most pivotal relationship uh, between, you know, you as chief executives is with your boards um and earning that or, or demonstrating the trust and the respect and the, and the building the cohesive constructive relationship that you need with your board have you found that you know have you found that more of a challenge um because you've not been able to physically sit down with with you know with the board as a team dave what is um what uh what's, what's been your experience of c connecting with the board so uh, I'll jump in if that's all right, Andrew. Um, I would say that's been um, one of, aside from the health that my family's maintained and, and those around me, been one of the blessings actually from this pandemic experience for us. Coming in as, as the, the new person, having a crisis enabled me to build stronger relationships with my board and leadership earlier than I think I would have had otherwise. So it certainly affected the tour uh, and getting out and, and building those those one on one relationships with the members. But again, in the element of a crisis, and I think it strengthened also key leadership on my staff early on as well, working extremely long days and constant communication with each other. So I think I think the catalyst for building a stronger relationship earlier was, in fact, this pandemic. And I don't know that I would have had that um absent absent the last uh 12 months especially you know what occurred in march and april and may where construction was largely shut down in pennsylvania you know it's amazing i do think that having having made it through this this period of challenge i mean won't you have demonstrated yourself and earned the credibility that uh, you know no one else will have accomplished this no matter how many decades you, they they served especially those of you replacing long long tenured executives i mean you have to have earned a badge of honor. You have to have, I don't know, I'm, I'm hoping earned your, your board's respect to, to a higher level because of what you've brought the organization through. Is that not going to be the case? I mean, especially, you know, I, I think for Dave, I mean, having replaced someone with 30 plus years who was beloved and, and highly respected. I mean, this allows you to kind of, I don't know, jump ahead <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, in in what you've what you've accomplished with with this audience so Lisa, yeah, it, it, it certainly uh, leaves ahead. i'm sorry i'm sorry i was gonna say yeah. it certainly leaves uh, a mark in, in a different way right it creates uh, a milestone if you will so i'm sorry Victoria, go ahead no no not at all i would agree 100 um yeah you know, so again i'm lucky that i'm working with a group of peers and many of them on the board are in these independent pharmacy settings so living out the covid vaccine sort of situation um, every day, uh, some of our hospital pharmacy colleagues as well. But the idea that I was able to kind of come in and wrap myself around those issues pretty quickly, um, establish relationships with key agencies like our Department of Health, um, get a little bit of an inroad to the governor's office um, and kind of report that out on a regular basis and actually handle some individual um, vaccine um, uh, securing vaccine issues from the department and just kind of interfacing with the department on behalf of some of my uh, pharmacies has really sort of established um, some trust and faith that, that you know, I understand the issues and can move this forward. Um, we also had only two months to plan for our mid-year meeting, and I had to move the board quickly in January to decision to go virtual again and approve um, a small investment in a virtual platform, which was um, a different sort of path than they had been on before. Um, I got the green light and then we had to quickly, quickly get this uh, meeting set up on the platform. We pulled it off quite successfully. Um, a lot of great feedback from participants, particularly because they were able to use an app, interact virtually like they hadn't been able to before in their previous meeting. Um, so you're know, just kind of being able to, to move through some key decision making, uh, do that quickly, 
plan out programs um, on a short timeline uh, has really sort of, you know, set kind of given them uh, the opportunity to sit back, focus on their own issues around COVID vaccine and kind of let me run the ship, make some decisions. I also actually went ahead, well, my predecessor had said, if 501c6 organizations get approval for a PPP loan, a paycheck protection uh, loan, you might want to pursue that, which I did and got approved and was able to tell them, you know, guess what? We've got some you know, extra money in the budget this year to offset salaries and expenses. Um, so that was another win pretty early on in my tenure. So, you know, just being able to kind of pull some of those things off in the midst of a pandemic um, lets your board sort of, you know, understand that you've got this. And there's also a lot of flexibility in the you know, realization that my first six months would be not only a learning curve, but dealing with the COVID-19 vaccine. And so they've given me the breathing room to again, kind of make that my priority and now move on to some programmatic priorities. Yeah, yeah you, you, everything from the shift in events to financial management, technology hiccups, that technology that becomes you know, that much more important to all of us now. There's, there's been a little bit of everything. I think in these six months or nine months, you've, you've had <laughs> maybe 10 years worth of, of challenges all in a, in, a, in a smaller window of time, but it wasn't planned. You each have about the same staff. And, and I think that's kind of an interesting coincidence that we, that we now can, uh, can chat about. What has staff management looked like? I don't know if you were all in person prior to this um and and have had to to make the shift but what has staff managed you each mentioned it as part of your challenge um upon uh, upon taking the new role what does staff management look like now coming out of this um and are are your staff ready to to return to that normal simon what what did it look like for this organization prior to to your joining um i think because they had a hiatus between directors uh, between uh, leaders that there was uh, um, almost a sort of uh, get on and run it themselves with some input from individual board members um, which was uh, a challenge that they rose to and, and responded really well to um, it has it has meant that um, coming into the role we've had some conversations around okay you guys have stepped into the role and, and taken on some of the responsibilities of the of the chief executive um, and they said, well, we, we did this anyway. We did this in the past when we changed chief executives and when there were gaps that we just stepped in and filled the role. So I've been, I'm really lucky to be supported by a, a very strong team. In terms of, in terms of management, um, we're, we're still having very regular meetings. In fact, much more regular meetings than I would normally have with a team uh, because I'm still trying to learn about the industry and the history and all the all the stuff that isn't written down, you know, the who likes who and who doesn't like who, those sort of issues uh, within <laughs> the membership, uh, which you just don't get uh, remote because most conversations are still pretty much one on one without the body language and all the all the associated stuff that goes with it, all the all the kind of off camera discussions that people have around the the water cooler or over a coffee, um, you you don't get as much of that. So so that's been a challenge. Yeah. Now, Victoria, you have your situation is a little unique in that you mentioned that these staff are, are peers and they too are are long tenured members of this this profession. Was it uh, was it difficult managing remotely or shifting? And I know you even were looking at a at, at a relocation yourself. It was a, a little mix of of uh, extra chaos in there while taking this on. Right. So um, actually, the staff uh, one is a long time. Um, uh, she's in a bookkeeper role. Um, the others are actually young uh, college graduates, recent, fairly recent college graduates that were kind of moved into this role and, and kind of trained on site, um, none of whom are pharmacists. So they're still relying on sort of my expertise there and the board. Um, but they were uh, working remotely previously. And from what I could gather from my predecessor, somewhat su pretty successfully. Um, again, with, with a couple of them being very young, they're very comfortable in that space. Um, so I actually rely on them, you know, for some technology and, and you know, some of that, that prowess that I don't bring to the role necessarily, being a little more seasoned. Um, but previous to um, this role, I had been managing a staff remotely for a few years and actually over, t over the course of 26 years now, um, worked remotely quite a bit. So for me, it was a comfort level I had 
Elisa, you and I actually did some writing around, you know, managing a remote staff. Um, you know, there's there are nuances to it. Communication to me is you know fundamental in any setting, but when your staff is remote, even more important. So having been in the office two days a week before um, just this month, I really use that time to be accessible, sit down with staff, have a meeting, do one-on-ones, you know, just kind of create that comfort level for them so they know how to, how to approach me, I know how to approach them, and just sort of establish some, some you know, relationships there that will segue into the remote setting. And that has seemed to work quite well. Great. Now, Dave, the, the office that you came from prior, um, what did what did that look like versus what the MBA was thrown into during COVID? Sure. So to give the context, I want to take one step prior to that. So I was with an association. So this is my second association role. Um, I came on in 2017 to a single craft trade association in the Western Pennsylvania construction market. And it, uh, it had one part-time admin uh, bookkeeper, we outsourced the uh, accounting and financials and, and myself, and that was it. Uh, but prior to that, I had been supervising too many people. I had over 20 direct reports and, and multiple offices. And so it went from a feeling of hundred miles an hour to about 50 miles an hour, even though it was a new space and a new environment for myself. And so then making the move here with a larger staff, um, certainly more uh, tenured in their roles and their comp uh, competencies was uh, was a, a great adjustment. I say great because it was great to be able to have folks on the team that you could rely on and that knew, um, as Simon had said, kind of those um, uh, water cooler or off camera conversations and relationships behind the scenes and the history of some of those relationships. So I think that's um, that was a, a great adjustment. But it was a it was a significant adjustment for me going from um, supervising um, a much smaller number in a part time capacity and really um, wearing many of those hats that now I've got uh, people on my team that, that can wear and, and do, do a great job with that. That's great. That's great. Now, you know, we're, we're all through, uh, hopefully, the worst of this. We're, we're almost halfway to, uh, to 2021. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Don't jinx anything. Um, what You each have brought something special to these roles. It's why you were selected. You were the the winning candidate. You were the person that they've they've entrusted these organizations to. What what's been your greatest takeaway from from these unique experiences? You had you had experience coming into it. You knew it wasn't going to be easy. Um, maybe Dave was the only one with a, a little less preparation, having taken the uh, the new role just months before um, COVID really shut everything down. But now. You know, whether it be patting yourself on the back or just wanting to to jot down some lessons learned, what's been your greatest takeaway from from this period of time, Victoria? What are your What are your thoughts as you you look back and, and give yourself some credit for for all this? So, um, yeah, this is typically an area where I don't do a lot of patting on the back, but I have to say, uh, my board is very good, particularly my officers, about doing that for me. And every time we're on a call, whether it's a, a member town hall or you know, with a group of, of colleagues from other associations. Um, my presence, you know, just goes on and on about, wow, she hit the ground running. What a great job. We couldn't imagine getting through this without her. And I'm like, okay, um, yeah, he's right. So, uh, you know, again, they were all sort of uh, distracted, if you will, with their own uh, crisis and their own uh, practices. So, you know, they really need somebody just to kind of jump in and, and run this and have confidence. They didn't have to really stop as volunteers and worry too much about it. And they didn't. So I think that really one of the silver linings for me in all this, despite you know the craziness of this past few months, is the opportunity um, to show members really value in their membership, especially during the crisis. You know the the association's response to their uh, vaccine concerns and issues, pulling off a successful virtual meeting, um, and most recently, just last week, completing their first ever uh, virtual legislative event. So annually, they will take their members into Harrisburg. Uh, tour the Capitol, have uh, tabletop displays where they share their research. Um, they're there to educate the public that's coming through and then have um, individual meetings with their district legislators. And they did not get an opportunity in 2020 to do that at all. Um, there was a big push from our students who um, really enjoy that opportunity and hundreds of them come to do that again. And so we had to, if you will, pivot, you know, word, word of the pandemic. Um, to something that would allow them to have that opportunity. For some of them, this was a capstone 
for their government relations advocacy program that we run annually for students. Um, and so when we announced back about six weeks ago, we're going to move to a virtual event, there was a lot of interest from the universities. Some students started the preparation and we held um, a formal, two formal educational events on the first day. And then probably about a dozen individual, 15 uh, legislator sessions that involved constituents from our membership. So for me, that was a huge win on, again, short timeline to be able to, you know, get back to some semblance of normalcy. And, you know, from a legislative perspective, that's how they're conducting most of their meetings still here in Pennsylvania. Um, so this was not new territory for them. They were very open to it and knew and always looked forward to us being there in person in any case. So we're very receptive when we ask them to participate in this event this year. So um, for me, it was just, you know, just the, the opportunity to show value in the association, even in, um, even though it looks and feels quite different right now. You know, I wonder both for the association's value proposition and for executives themselves, when all of this, you know, again, fingers crossed, goes back to normal, and you don't have these big dragons to slay and you don't have these big wins to deliver, how will executives be measured? You know, are, are we setting these high bars not only for member expectation, but for executive performance? And you'll become a victim of your own <laughs> reputation. You know, you will become uh, unable to to meet these these high bars. Simon, what are what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I think was going to make exactly that point, Lisa, that um, the, the danger for association leaders is that uh, because we've we've managed to not only respond to to the pandemic uh, and uh, in the UK as well, Brexit to support our members um, while our while our volunteer boards have been off trying to manage their own businesses and families and keep everyone uh, around them safe. Um, they've they've stepped back. And they're and they're more and more reliant on the on the chief executive, um, and I think one of the one of the potential challenges for this for the CEO role moving forward is maintaining that level of uh, delivery and trust in a post pandemic landscape. Are are the are your volunteers going to say, hey, these guys have been running it themselves. Let's let's maintain our step away from it. I mean, that's a whole other podcast in itself. Again. <laughs> exactly. I'll keep, keep giving you topics. This I know. Is I think you're angling to come back. I think you're angling to come back. <laughs> um, and uh, and just kind of linked into that, um, I, I think there's a there's a uh, I call it the three R's for for associations. In in recent times, it's been about resilience, both. Of, of the organization itself. So that's changing your systems to, um, for example, uh, online courses or delivery of, of projects via Teams. Um, it's about resilience of the marketplace. So supporting your members to stay, to, uh, to, to stay in business through very, very difficult times. Um, it's about um, reassurance. So it's about that, and that hasn't been a role for associations in the past. This is a really new one for us to, to actually reassure our members to say, we're going to get through this. You know, the, the, the world isn't going to stop. There, there are good times ahead and we will support you to to still be there when, when we come out of this, perhaps in a different format. And for us to, us to reassure them to say the landscape will be changed, but we're here to ensure you, you have um, sight of what that might be. And then the final one is about relevance and that speaks to 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 um uh, the, the points that victoria made around um showing your members that you are relevant to them and as as they need to keep paying you that subscription and keep supporting you and coming to your events because you are the hub of that community and it's a very lonely time we find ourselves in both in terms of the the chief executive but also our members so that's that's the the three the three r's that i i would put forward I love it. Thank you. Uh, maybe that will, that's a podcast in itself. The three R's with Simon Forrester. Am, am I going to get a, I'm going to get a pound each for the, for the, all these suggestions. And I, there must be some, I get, I, Andrew, Andrew's <laughs> shaking his head. <laughs> Just put it on Andrew's tab. Just put it on okay, Andrew's tab. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. So Dave, again, the most unique new exec transition uh, of an exec with with experience, of course. But you know, you had those few months, especially the the overlap with the outgoing exec, and then a couple months prior to uh, to it all all going wrong for uh, for the world with uh, the global pandemic. What what's been your greatest takeaway? Maybe something that that you're most proud of your staff or even yourself for, um, and that you think you know. Your, your, your greatest learning experience in these in these 15 months? 
Sure. So, uh, so like my two esteemed colleagues on on the panel here, I, I would agree that I'm not one to necessarily do that. Uh, pat myself on the back um, very often, um, and I try to be as 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 uh, great as I can with giving that to the staff. Um, and the reality is, we have a very large um, industry evening of excellence event in the end of February every year. In person, it's between 12 and 1400 people, and we've got a, a building excellence awards program that we um, uh, spend months on and we've got judges for, and, and, and it's really an event that ties all levels of our industry together. And it is the premier event. And so we held that about two and a half weeks before everything shut down in 2020. And in many cases, it was the last event that many of uh, our members and people in the industry were together um, before, the, before the pandemic shut everything down. So pivoting to, again, there's the word, right, to a virtual event for this year and using the same level of high quality media production and uh, changing the way that we try to show value to our partners and our sponsors who are still interested in supporting the event this year um, was a huge, I won't say that it was a sacred cow that we that we changed because we had to, um, but it was, it was something that I'm very proud of our team for being able to transition into the new format. And uh, uh, the relationships with the board, the strength, the confidence that that hopefully this, this year and, and 15 months has um, has given them and in, in my ability to help lead this organization and this team, I think is is one of the takeaways that I have. And it, it thankfully came organically. That's that's amazing. Well, if no one else, if you won't do it for yourselves, Andrew and I will uh, will provide virtual pats on the back and, and thank you all so much for for not only the professionalism and leadership, but but the. I don't know the grace under pressure. It's it's very uh, it's very impressive to watch executives, both new and and experienced, go through this and lead their lead their organizations in a way that's not only making their boards proud, but other other association executives in the space. This truly is uh, a profession, and and one of of esteem esteemed excellence. And you you three are, are great examples of that. So thank you so much, not only for what you've done, what you're doing. But for joining us today, Andrew and I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I think these conversations are important to be had, to see what what CEOs are going through, to pull back the curtain a little bit and uh, and share the, the imperfections as much as the perfections uh, during these transitional periods. And uh, we thank you for your 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 willingness to share and uh, and we hope we we do get to have you back. And Simon, I mean, we've already got you on the schedule now for I think four, four and a half <laughs> podcasts, given all the the gems you've dropped. Um, but thank you, thank all three of you for your time this morning. We hope you've enjoyed the podcast and you're now part of the Association Transformation family. So thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, to all of you listening, we hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. If there's a subject you'd like us to explore or if you'd like to join us as a guest, you can tweet us at Association Transformation or email us hello at your consort.com and we'll draw upon our network of new CEOs, old CEOs, executive staff, board members, everyone we can think of to put together a podcast worth listening to. If you've enjoyed today's musings, um, you can find Association Transformation wherever you get your podcasts. Make us one of your favorites. And until next time, we say stay well and put your members and your mission first. Association Transformation is brought to you in partnership between Consult Strategy and Brewer Pratt Solutions in support of the Institute of Association Leadership.